The children are our future, yet many of their schools are failing. It's time for a turnaround. I'm Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins. Let's, let's talk it out. The art of deep, rich conversations is a lost art in our present culture. On Talk It Out, we talk about real issues that affect real people that will make a real difference in your life. We reclaim and restore the art of meaningful conversations. We think together, grow together, and are transformed by the connections we make. What we start, you actually finish. So join us as we talk it out. Again, I'm Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins, and today we're talking about our children and their education. The state of Georgia has acknowledged a serious issue of failing schools and created a turnaround effort called First Priority Act. The man tapped to lead the effort is our guest today, Dr. Eric Thomas, Chief Turnaround Officer at the Georgia Department of Education. Welcome, Dr. Thomas. Happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Welcome to Georgia. Thank you so much. Welcome, Welcome back, back home. to Georgia. Welcome back home. <laughs> Welcome back home. We're happy, man. I'm excited about you and your role. Thank you. And what you're called to do. Before we talk about your role here in Georgia, talk a little bit about what you did prior to coming, coming back home. Absolutely. Uh, the past six years, I was the Chief Support Officer at the University of Virginia. Uh, there was a school turnaround program. It's been in existence for about 15 years. Uh, we work with schools and districts across the country. Um, over the past six years, I'm sure we've worked with probably 40, 50 districts, uh, some very large, some very small, everything in between, uh, but it's very similar work uh, supporting schools and districts as they attempt to, you know, sort of launch a turnaround effort in their, in their area. What made you want to come and take this job? You know, we've had so much controversy. We had the Opportunity School District thing going on, and people are afraid of this major takeover. <laughs> so give me a sense of what made you accept this call and, <coughs> and, 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 and kind of begin to um, demystify this role. Definitely. You know, obviously there's been a lot of conversation over the past, I guess, 18 months. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky to say that I wasn't a part of any of that conversation. <laughs> so there, for me, there's some gaps in some knowledge. So I try not to even have much conversation about the Opportunity School District. Uh, the voices of the citizens of the state uh, were heard. Uh, what my work now is, is to support schools and districts as they turn around their schools. And I think that's such an important piece there. You know, this is not a takeover. We're not firing principals. We're not firing teachers. The principal, the superintendent, the school board still governs the school, still governs the district. Uh, my team's role is to support them and be a partner in the work. So let's talk about the first priority. Act. Give Absolutely. us a sense of what that's about and how that empowers your office and your role. I mean, ultimately, the first priority act, it's House Bill 338, um, and it simply created this position. Uh, it provides me with a team. And our role is to literally work with a school and a school district to identify what are the challenges in that school and potentially what are the challenges in that district. And we always talk about, at least our work, we talk about non-academic challenges and academic challenges. I think for the past 10 to 12 years, there was such a focus on sort of the teaching, the learning aspect. I'm a teacher by trade, so I totally get curriculum, pedagogy, formative assessments. However, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that kids walk into the schoolhouse with some outside challenges. And if we're not at least willing to consider those, acknowledge those, and quite honestly, attempt to address those, our kids never will really rise to the level that, that I think they're capable of rising to. So how do you get that? I, my wife's a principal, a uh, principal of Cooper Middle School in Cobb County. Love great school, she's a great principal. But I've always found, even in her context, and even in raising our own children and, and the friends they walk with, well, my wife and her colleagues can really do a great job what happens in the building. Absolutely. But there's things that happen outside the building. How do, how's your office going to help us engage that part of the story in the journey? Dr. Watkins, what I think you're speaking about is it's complicated. Yeah. This is not simply about this teacher's a good teacher or that teacher's not a good teacher or this principal's a good principal or not. It's more complicated than that. It's complex. Uh, one of the first things that we look at is how do we partner not only with the school and the district, but with organizations in that community. This has to be a sort of an all hands on deck approach. We've got to bring faith based organizations in. We've got to bring the United Way in. We've got to bring in universities. We've got to bring in parents. Everyone has to be a part of this equation. This is not about the chief turnaround officer. It's not about the principal. It's about all of us. And I'm glad you say that because we sometimes think you can be like Superman or Superwoman, kind of Ooh, running not and at all. the day, right? <laughs> and what you're really talking about is kind of collaborative partnership Absolutely. that's going to make the difference, right? Absolutely. 
it's really about a partnership. I mean, that's really the theme that, that anyone who's heard me speak and anything that we've done in the past three months, this has to be a partnership. No one entity can do this by themselves because it's complicated. Yeah. If it was simple, you and I could spend a couple of afternoons and we'd come up with some great formula. It's complicated. So so you, you've been in this position three months. What has been the biggest like aha moment or like uh oh moment for you? Oh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, obviously, there's still you know some remnants um, of the Opportunity School District. Um, again, I've had the luxury of not having had been a part of those conversations, uh, but there's still some remnants of that. So I think when I walk into the door, I think the first impression is, you know, here's that takeover guy. Um, it's absolutely nothing close to that. So I think that's a sort of an aha. And I'd say probably the other aha for me. Um, again, I was born in Savannah. Right. I spent my my early years in Savannah. I haven't been in the state for a while, uh, but having an opportunity to really travel all ends of the state. The kids are kids. So no matter where they are, no matter who their parents are, kids are kids. And I think we as the adults, we have to honor the fact that no matter what their zip code is, no matter how many parents are in the, in the household, no matter all of those other indicators, um, these are still kids. And I think we're obligated to do right by kids. So as you're traveling the state, we have this, I think this interesting uh, uh, dichotomy in Georgia, if you will, this kind of urban versus rural mm -hmm. dynamic. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what you've learned versus and what you've seen in the urban districts in relationship to the rural districts. Absolutely. You know, I think there's a, a growing conversation around poverty. Uh, poverty, unfortunately, has been around a long time. I've been there, done that, so I understand that. Rural pro poverty looks a little different than urban poverty. Um, I've seen them both. Um, in my work at the University of Virginia, we work with some very large urban school districts, three, 400,000 students in the district. We also work in some very small rural districts. Um, the challenges are very complicated. They're just simply a little bit different. In Atlanta Metro, for example, there's still resources here. So there may be you know, some aspects of poverty, but quite honestly, there are resources available. You just gotta figure out how to tap into those resources. In some of the rural areas in the state, quite honestly, there's not a doctor. There's not a dentist. You know, there's not a university within 40, 50, 60 miles. That looks a little bit different than sort of what happens in an urban setting. So it's different. So when you think about the approach, and I know you're, you're early on, but you have this great background. As you approach kind of the, these very complicated ways to resolve these issues in these districts, rural versus urban, mm -hmm. what are some different ways you think of those strategies will look different based on that context? I, I would say probably the, one of the strategies or one of the differences is when we start thinking about in a rural setting the opportunity or the uh, uh, opportunity to sort of bring in talent, and I'm talking about teacher talent, leadership talent, that's an incredible difference than in, again, sort of Atlanta Metro. You know, if you've got a principal position that's posted in one of the large urban districts in Atlanta, you've probably got 30, 40 candidates. In some of the rural areas, you might not have one. So how do we address that? And that's at the principal level, that's at the teacher level. So one of the things we're working with those districts that we're presently working with in, in sort of Southwest Georgia is sort of rethinking and, and sort of being creative and innovative around talent management. How do we leverage blended learning? How do we leverage technology? In What's blended learning? Some concept in which, you know, sort of there's some face-to-face -face interaction between student and teacher, and then there's some online interface with curriculum. Um, so how do we look at Leveraging technology, how do we look at leveraging, if you've got a dynamite teacher, how do we allow that teacher to have an impact on more than just 20, 30 kids in his or her class? Are there some creative ways to do some of those pieces? Um, and some of that work has taken place across the country. Some of that work is, you know, quite honestly, I've had some experience in supporting districts in some of those areas, so I'm excited about that area. So I wrestle with this term, failing schools, right? Because I think it kind of um, stigmatizes an institution. Mm -hmm. where in every institution, every building, there's those bright spots, there's those superstars, Absolutely. there's those great classes, those great students. But we then kind of categorize the school as failing. So first I want to uh, just uh, uh, confess my struggle with the term itself. But saying all that, and we use that term, give us a sense of what categorizes these schools that are on that list. That list that I, I hate the list. <laughs> but I know we need the list. We need these indicators to know where we can help. We need some way to diagnose so we can mm -hmm. begin to partner with institutions to make a difference. But give a sense of what defines a school to be on this list that, that might be uh, one that you might work with. A absolutely. You know, the list, and we joke about the list. Yeah. Um, ultimately, in the state, the lowest 5% of the schools in the entire state are identified and that's sort of those schools create the list or sort of make up the list and it's all based on what's called the CCRPI 
Um, and that's simply a sort of an accumulation, quite honestly, of tests. So what does that acronym stand for? Um, college Career Readiness Performance Standards, I believe. Gotcha, gotcha, or gotcha. index. Right, right, right. Um, Ultimately, it really is about, you know, what are the test scores that those kids have demonstrated or that school has demonstrated? Uh, there's an attendance indicator. There's a um, climate and culture indicator. So it's looking at all of those indicators that attempts to sort of, you know, sort of grade a school. And, and I totally agree with you that I don't know that that single grade, you know, is the be all within all. However, at the moment, that is the metric. Mm -hmm. So when, 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 when that's identified with these schools, so it, it appears in my research preparing for this show that it's almost like those who want to work with you versus um, those who have to work with you. Can you give me a sense of that balance, what's going on there? You know, I've been in the role for three months. Um, ultimately, there's 27 districts and over 100 schools. So we decided to sort of not tackle, obviously, 100 schools in November. Uh, so we simply, you know, looked at lots of data, an incredible amount of data. We went out and had conversations with superintendents and school boards. Uh, we looked at academic data. We looked at non-academic data. And ultimately, uh, we sort of identified, quite honestly, there's some districts in southwest Georgia who, at this point in time, it simply made sense to start there. Um, this idea that, you know, people are sort of choosing or not choosing to be partners, you know, I, I, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, we're not going to force anybody to marry us. Um, however, I think we all have to appreciate that if students in schools are not performing, then that conversation may need to change at some point. Yeah, because I, I still say, too, uh, I'm not Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins without quality public education. Absolutely. That saved my life because my, my parents didn't have an option to send me somewhere else. So talk about um, this initial uh, uh, cadre of schools you're working with. Give me a sense of who they are, mm -hmm. where they are, and how this is proceeding. Absolutely. Uh, ultimately, we partnered with five districts, mostly sort of in the southwest part of the state. Uh, Bibb County, uh, Doherty County, Clay County, Randolph County, and Dooley County. Again, we looked at just an incredible amount of data. We had conversations with those either superintendent or, or school boards, and based on all of that data, based on all of those conversations, that's where we decided to start at. Um, I think what's really special, and again, I wish I could say that we had some forethought about it, but when you think about, you know, as you talked about rural Georgia versus sort of Atlanta Metro and sort of two, two Georgias, um, almost by accident, we picked those districts, and I think there's an incredible amount of synergy within the state around addressing the needs in rural parts of Georgia. Uh, I wish we could say that we knew that walking in, but sort of by happenstance, um, we're now creating this synergy. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce is really sort of, you know, creating this work in the rural area. The governor speaks about it. Uh, there's a rural development council in the House of Representatives. So there's this, there's this energy about how do we support students and communities in rural parts of the state. We're going to take a break right here. We're going to come back, though, so stay with us. We want to talk about this urban identity. I live in Atlanta and my church is on Auburn Avenue. We're going to come back and talk about how we're going to partner with APS and Fulton and South Fulton in Cobb County. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our guest today is Dr. Eric Thomas, Chief Turn Officer with the Georgia Department of Education. And we're talking about at this segment, urban schools, mm -hmm. right? I live in Atlanta. My mm -hmm. church is on Auburn Avenue. We partner with Hope Hill Elementary School. Great school. So um, talk about what's happening in urban districts and how those who want to walk along beside these districts, what, is that part, what, are, what could those partnerships look like? Yeah, presently, again, the schools and the districts that we're working in are in southwest Georgia, although we are potentially going to have some conversations with some of the Atlanta metro districts. Um, obviously, you've got students in those communities, you've got families in those communities who, who need support. And I think it's really about how do we coordinate all of the various resources that are, may be in the community, how do you pull those resources together, aligned to certain levels, maybe small priorities. I think my experience has been in many of those schools, there's lots of things going on, and in fact, sometimes too, too many much. things yeah. going on, right. and you don't do anything extremely well. So our strategy is, you know, at each school, what are three or four things that you're going to try to hit a home run on? What are three or four priorities? What are the root causes of those challenges? And then we're going to align every resource that we can support you with, either in the school or in the community, aligned to one of those priorities. So 
every sort of school has a customized approach. You know, there is no cookie cutter, here's the manual. Every school has a customized approach to their work. Um, I think if we end up, you know, having conversations about, you know, some district here in Georgia um, or in Atlanta Metro, I think that conversation really will be really important about what are the community partnerships that are already there, how are they supporting schools, but how do we align their work to the needs of the school. So resources, so a lot of folks walk, watching this show are, are pastors, clergy persons, um, faith-based organizations. What should their role be and how could they think about partnering in this process and wh where are the resources going to come well, from? I'd say two things. Uh, one of the members of my team, Ashley Harris, uh, she is the Director of Partnerships and Community Engagement on our team. I mean, her full-time role is to work with schools and districts to secure resources to fill gaps that the school may can't provide What's themselves. What's her name again? Ashley Harris. That's who you want to call. There go you ahead. go. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so literally, that's her full-time job, is to create partnerships, solicit resources, create opportunities in which external stakeholders can be a part of the work. So I think that's such an important part. Other members on my team, we have, or well, will have, we're still in the hiring process in some of the situations, but we'll have, you know, whether we call them coaches or transformation specialists, but there'll be a person that's attached to a district and a small set of schools full time. I mean, they will be in those schools five days a week. Their job is to support the principal, support teachers in executing the plan that they created based on those three or four priorities. If you talk about these coaches or transformation officers, whatever you call them, what are their qualifications? What will they look like? And um, um, will they be housed in the district or will their office be at the Department of Education? They'll be housed in the district. Uh, we may have them at the department once a month for some sort of retreat, workshop, you know, within the team, but they will literally be in the district 100% of the time. From a qualification standpoint, you asked a little early about some challenges. Actually, that's been one of the challenges. Um, you know, I really believe that talent is such a critical piece of this work, the quality of the principal, the quality of the teacher, and in this situation, quite honestly, the quality of that coach. So we've interviewed, I don't even know what the number is now, uh, but it needs to be the right fit. And that's the right fit is from a culture standpoint, that's the right fit is from an expertise standpoint, a capacity standpoint. Um, and you've gotta have that, you know, sort of that passion to do this work. You know, I, I truly believe that this is missionary work. This is not just about educating, it's about changing kids' lives. I mean, I believe that, I, I say all the time, I say my wife when she goes to work every day, this is salvific work. You're oh, literally absolutely. saving kids' lives. You're really, uh, really um, sitting them on a trajectory to have the kind of life they dream and aspire to have. How about your role? I mean, I know where you're housed at. How intimately involved will you be in the process on the ground and uh, in the school districts themselves? Absolutely, I will be in schools and districts on a regular basis. We're still figuring out what that looks like. Uh, you know, we to talk about building this plane while it's already in the air. That's yeah. definitely what we're doing. Uh, my vision is that I would be in each district, if not once a week, every other week. Um, how often I'm in schools, we'll sort of figure out what that looks like. Um, I think ultimately it really will be the coach in the schools. I'll probably have a little bit more interaction at the district level, the superintendent, the cabinet, and the school board level, uh, but I'll be in schools. Yeah. I won't be hiding. <laughs> well, that's important, right? I think Absolutely. Time, we, we, we can kind of be kind of be disconnected, and the issues to really be to really be connected and transformational. So when, when you when you when you think about those kinds of relationships, how do you plan to build those relationships with the person that you'll be working with, not only in your team but in the districts as well? Lots of conversations. Uh, I'm a true believer that if you want to influence someone, you have to connect with them. There has to be a certain level of trust. I would really believe that you've got to allow them to own their work. You know, I talked about this idea of creating or identifying priorities. Schools and districts are going to create those priorities. Some of these schools I've never been in in my life, so you know, it would almost be insane for me to pretend that I walk in, here are your three or four priorities. Um, I think when you do that, when you empower others, when you acknowledge their work, when you acknowledge their expertise, I think that's how you build this partnership, that we're in this together. Your success is my success. If you look, at, are, are there other states who've done this well? Because it appears in many contexts this, this doesn't work well. Do you have models that you're, that, that, that's informing your way of developing your department? Actually, in regards to the concept from a state level, you know, there are some other states that have done something similar. Uh, the idea of a chief turnaround officer, I think this is maybe a little bit more innovative. In regards to the strategy around the work, again, I was at the University of Virginia for six years. That organization or that program has been there for about 15 years. Um, if you're familiar with ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, as a part of that work, you have to have evidence-based strategies to really lead the work. Um, our partnership at UVA actually is 
one of the very few evidence-based approaches in which there is some evidence to suggest that it actually has improved outcomes. And it's very few, quite honestly, I think we're, we were one of like four uh, that was at a certain tier to suggest that you know this work is actually the right work. Let's change, let's change, let's change. Sure. So talk about leadership. So what, what informs your leadership? I mean, I, I love coach. I love uh, studying the life of coaches, how they build teams and turn around teams and sustain success. People like a Nick Saban as an example, <laughs> um, a Bill Belichick as an example. But we kind of like him because they beat the Falcons. <laughs> yeah, but that's another story. That's another. Um, so give me a sense. What, what are some leadership models that inform your style of leadership? You know, I think there's two things that sort of drive me. Uh, I definitely have a social justice sort of lens. Uh, I really believe that we as individuals, uh, that we have a responsibility to help others. Uh, so there's this social justice lens that really sort of anchor much of what I do. You know, I think a lot of times we talk about transformational leadership and you know, it's a, it's a really good buzzword sometimes. I think what, for me what that means and how that sort of drives my thought is I think you have to really connect with individuals. You're not so much leading them, you're partnering with them. You're honoring them, there's a vision, there, there's, this, uh, there's this agreement that we're gonna go and do something special. And I think how do you sort of conduct yourself, how do you model, uh, how do you support others in that work? Those are the sort of things that anchor me. If I went to your bookshelf, what would be the most used and tattered book on your bookshelf? Ooh, many. Um, anything that deals with change, uh, Michael Fullen, anything that deals with how do you encourage, how do you promote change, because change is hard. You know, we become very comfortable, right or wrong, good or bad, with what we've always done. So how do you sort of promote change? Um, I think that's probably, I don't know, I've probably got 10 or 15 books around some sort of change. Give, give me one book that you read over and over. One of my professors said to me, you don't really know what you've read unless you've read the author three times. Ooh. Like for me, like Thomas Kuhn's book, um, The uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, mm -hmm. it's an annual read of mine, right? Um, Carter's work on change, mm -hmm. the dynamic of change, or um, this developing a sense of urgency, right? I love to read uh, books by coaches and mm -hmm. how they turn teams around. Tony mm -hmm. Dungy's a big idol of mine. How he turned the Tampa Buccaneers around, actually transformed the culture. Cause Dungy argues it's the culture that has to be transformed, right, which is beliefs, values, and then norms. Mm -hmm. So are there any books like that or personalities, you know, this leader, this person, you know, Jeffrey Kennedy, you know, people like that. Anybody like that? I, I would say from a personal standpoint, and, and, and again, obviously we're in Atlanta, Martin Luther King was always sort of a pusher for me because he had very little power. If you think about the amount of power he had, very little, not an elected official. I mean, he didn't have tons of resources. But if you think about what he accomplished, yeah. that's leadership. Yeah. That's powerful. So out of his books like Strength to Love, uh, Why We Can't Wait, um, Where Do We Go From Here, KSR Community, um, Letter from the Birmingham Jail, yeah. is there any one of those books, Trumpet of Conscience, that kind of jump out of yours that kind of resonate with your work and, co and, and connection with uh, Dr. King? I'm not sure of any of those specifically. Um, I think the letter from Birmingham, I think, is yeah. always something that connects because I think, again, a lot of people had exposure to that. Um, I think you talked about in regards to, you know, just some literature, uh, Cotter in regards to the heart of change. Yeah. You know, if you want to change individuals, that is important, yeah. but you've got to hit people in the heart as well. Yeah, yeah. He, says, uh, he says head and heart, right? Head absolutely. And, heart. and if you don't feel and have this passion, what ain't gonna happen? That's exactly yeah. it, yeah. that's exactly yeah. it. So those yeah. are sort of things that yeah. really sort of anchor how I see the world yeah. and how I sort of attempt to navigate this work. So this issue of social justice, that's that at one of the course of your being, where does that come from? Probably my upbringing. Um, you know, I, I sometimes joke, you know, if you want to start tacking off all the indicators, I, I could probably check them all off. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not supposed to be here. Uh, single parent, you know, all of those indicators, you know, as an African-American male, you know, you, you understand what I mean by yeah. that. Um, and, and for me, everything that I've done as an adult has been about how do we bring up the next group? How do we reach back down and help this young man, help this young lady who may not have all the resources that we sometimes have in middle class America? How do we bring those kids up? Yeah, because that, 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 that changes the world. It really does. I mean, I'm like you, you know, single parent, uh, probably went to schools that may have been considered failing, but somehow made it, right? And yeah. so I still am committed to that part of my life at the core of my being is how do you help others? I think Absolutely. one thing King said, if I've helped anybody along the way, then my living has not been in vain. Absolutely. That's kind of been the ethos of my living. How can I help somebody, right? I believe that God gives you position, power, and privilege. Not position, power, and privilege, not for yourself, mm -hmm. but for the sake of others. Love it. Right? Absolutely. And I think about those caring teachers, Miss Muse, Miss Carswell, who told me. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, uh, my third grade teacher said to me, you know, uh, Ralph, you think you're going to be a pro football player, 
but you're too short. <laughs> she says, but you can read and you can talk. Mm -hmm. That's your saving grace. And I think about that one incident mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of a teacher believing in Love me. Love it. Then I had a teacher, um, uh, Miss Chickering, and she, um, I was too poor to like buy the weekly, we didn't get the books. She would buy me books. Wow and allow me to read, right? So think about the difference that that makes. Because I think that, that's at the core, right? Ab absolutely, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I really think, and, and to add to that, I think it's about exposure. Yeah. I think we've got to help kids see the possibilities because many of our kids live in situations yeah. where they don't yeah. know that there's something better. Yeah. And we've got to help them see that, yes, you know, that they can go out and do fantastic and incredible things as well. I think about my wife, she takes her kids to, you know, do the local college tours. And some of the kids who live in Atlanta, yeah. Had never been to Morehouse or Georgia Tech or Spelman or Georgia State, realizing it's really right down the street, but it's so far for them to see themselves That's exactly in it. that life. They can see it, and we can equip them to believe it and dream it. It can happen. As a, as a former principal, one of the things that we almost immediately did um, in Ohio, Central State University is about 90 minutes away yeah. from Cincinnati, yeah. and we took a group of kids to Central State on a pretty regular basis. And what they saw were young people that looked just like them. Some of them had braids, some of them sagged their pants, some of them had tats, but they looked just like them. And that was so important for them to, because many of the kids believed that you know, college was for someone else, yeah, yeah. and they had to see themselves on a college yeah. campus. And I think that's part of the work we have to do is, as, in, the, in these partnerships, right? Help them to see and then work along with them to actualize those dreams and make Absolutely. those dreams come true. Because I think the biggest thing about King that I admire was his ability to imagine a different world. Mm. In the midst of a segregated, oppressive South, he saw a different world. And if our kids can dream, we Absolutely. have to realize those dreams, we literally can change the world. Because mm -hmm. it's dreamers yeah. that literally change Always the world. Always has. Yeah. Always has. And I know you have a dream. So let's close with that. What's your, <laughs> what's your dream? You know, King had this dream, right? Mm -hmm. And he went to his grave fighting the ills of poverty, the ills of racism, the ills of militarism. And I think we're now inheriting his dream. That great book he wrote, Where Do We Go From Here? Mm -hmm. So what's your dream? You know, I, I don't know that it's a dream. Um, I think for the work that we're doing, obviously there's a metric that we need to hit as far as helping schools move off of this list. So, I mean, I think that's one piece of it. But for me, it's much bigger than that. It's really helping kids and helping communities really just change the trajectory of their lives. Because I think we all can appreciate if we can get for every kid that we can allow that kid to go and do something special in the schoolhouse, we've just impacted their kids. We've impacted the generation. We've impacted that family, that community. And if we ever want to see a great state of Georgia, if we ever want to see a great country, it's education that's going to do that. We're going to have to pause right here, but I want to <laughs> thank Dr. Eric Thomas, Chief Turn Officer with the Georgia Department of Education. Brilliant, brilliant man. I, I'm so excited that you're here. Thank and you what for you're having gonna me. Do. I think you're going to do great things with your team. Look, don't go away, because up next, my final thoughts. So here's what I think. I think Dr. Eric Thomas is the man for the job. His vision, it's doable, but it's gonna take us to partner with him. It's gonna take faith-based organizations and people like you and me to do what we're called to do to make our schools successful. If schools fail, we fail. We are part of that failure, but we can also be a part of that success. I also wanna know what you think. Write to me at programming at AIBTV.com and follow me on Twitter at Ralph Masui. Remember, you may very well change the world if you'll just talk it out. I'm Dr. Ralph Masui Watkins, and I'll talk to you real soon.